So welcome everyone to this uh, regional session uh, on Europe at the conference 70 years protecting people forced to flee, organized on the occasion of the 70th anniversary of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. My name is Roberto Cortinovis, I'm a researcher at the Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels, and I will be the moderator of, of this session, which is organized in partnership with the ASIL Horizon 2020 project. As a first thing, let me remind you that simultaneous language interpretation is available for this session. You can select your language of choice clicking on the interpretation feature in the Zoom toolbar. The title of this session is Unpacking EU Asylum Policy in Light of the UN Global Compact on Refugees, the Impacts of Containment on Trust and Refugee Protection. Over the previous year, 2020, EU policy developments on asylum have been heavily influenced by mounting evidence of systematic and often violent rejections of asylum seekers at EU borders, so-called pushbacks. In parallel, the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic has led to the introduction of border control and travel restrictions, which have made increasingly difficult for people in need of protection to seek asylum in Europe. Against this backdrop, the European Commission presented its new pact on migration and asylum last September. The new pact promises a normalization of EU policies by replacing ad hoc emergency measures with a durable framework that is able to work both in normal times and in times of crisis. The pact legislative proposals aim to establish a new system of internal solidarity within the EU, which gives member states the possibility to contribute in a number of ways, including as a new element by providing assistance to each other in carrying out procedures for returning irregular migrants. The pact puts a strong emphasis on an expanded use of accelerated asylum procedures at the border, based on the assumption that a relevant share of asylum seekers arriving in the EU come from countries with a low recognition rates or that can be considered as safe. As will be reflected in today's discussion, cooperation and partnership with third countries lies at the core of the new pact. What we can see here is the continuation of previous EU policies and initiatives driven by containment that is by the objective of limiting onward movements of asylum seekers from regions of origins towards Europe. These measures coexist in the pact, not always easily, with the promise for increased refugee mobility through expanded resettlement and complementary pathways for admission. In these sessions, we are going to look at this uh, and other developments in Europe through the lens of the Global Compact on Refugees, both its guiding principles, grounded in international refugee law, and its overall objectives to enhance solidarity with refugee and host communities. We are also going to consider to what extent current EU policies address the call in the compact to better include refugee voices and agency in the design of relevant initiatives. We have a panel of experts, which includes distinguished academics, but also activists and experts with relevant experience in devising initiatives to support refugee rights within our societies. I'm going to present our speakers uh, briefly. Uh, due to time constraints, I cannot provide uh, detailed descriptions of their profile. So we will first have three core presentations. Our first speakers will be Rosemary Byrne, Professor of Legal Studies at the New York University of Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. We will then hear from Jens Wedsted Hansen, Professor of Law at Oros University in Denmark. Our third speakers will then be Audrey Macklin, Professor and Rebecca Cook Chair in Human Rights Law at the University of Toronto in Canada. Uh, after our speakers' interventions, which will last for around 10 minutes each, I will give the floor to our discussants for their comments and observations. As you can see on the agenda, we are very glad to have with us today four discussants. Meltem Ineli Giar, Assistant Professor at the Suleiman Demirel University in Turkey. Mohamed Badran, founder and director of the Association Syrian Volunteers in the Netherlands. We will then hear from Anila Noor, who is a member of the European Commission expert group on the views of migrants and also, among others, managing director of the organization New Women Connectors. And finally, our last dis discussant will be Nicolas Feit Tan, who is a researcher specializing in international refugee law at the Danish Institute for Human Rights. As our discussants are supposed to speak for around five minutes each, we will then have time for an interactive discussion with the audience. 
And uh, in view of this, I would like to invite you to type your uh, question using the uh, Q&A tool uh, um, that is available in the Zoom toolbar. And when you please type your question, please also specify to whom of our panelists you would like to address your question. So as you see, we have a very uh, rich panel with seven presentations, interventions. And this also implies that we need to be quite careful with timekeeping. So without any further ado, I would like to turn now to our first speaker, Professor Rosemary Byrne from the New York University in Abu Dhabi. So Rosemary, I think a good way to start uh, our discussion today is to focus on the issue of solidarity and fair sharing of responsibility. Solidarity is at the core of the global compact, but is also a key legal principle of the common European asylum system. So I would like to ask you what's what is your view on how solidarity is framed in the new pact on migration, in uh, how it's embedded in recent EU initiatives, and in particular when it comes to the external dimension of asylum, and also based on this, how do you assess current developments in new cooperation with third countries? Rosemary, I, I give you the floor. Thank you very much. I am uh, really pleased to be part of, of this discussion and to be speaking about solidarity because it's not only at the core of uh, the proposal for new migration and asylum pact, but critically solidarity has been deployed in the context of refugee protection for the seven decades of which UNHCR has been in the refugee protection business. Um, and I think it's important, the work of Madeline Garlick at UNHCR on, on solidarity has been one of the seminal uh, pieces of writing, uh, but it's really important to acknowledge how central it is in the global protection lexicon and also in the global compact for refugees. It's a principle that highlights um, that the global compact represents political will and ambition of the international community as a whole for strength and cooperation uh, and solidarity with refugees and host, affected host communities. And I think what's important in thinking about the way in which the global compact embraces solidarity is the distinction they're being, that they're making between strength and cooperation and solidarity. They're overlapping, but they're distinct. The same as solidarity indeed is applying to refugees and to host states. And again, a sort of dual objective that is very important. One not at the expense indeed of the other. And the other uh, factor that I think is really interesting, particularly now about the um, elaboration of solidarity uh, that the commission has undertaken, as controversial as, as it may uh, rightfully be in many regards, is that solidarity as a concept itself in the context of, of COVID has really been resuscitated by the international community. The Secretary General's calling for so, uh, solidarity, the UN High Commissioners, both for Human Rights and Refugees, Security Council, General Assembly. In ways for past pandemics, uh, solidarity was really you know, being replaced by the more mechanical technocratic call for international cooperation. And I think the reason that solidarity is so important in the context of migration is because of the spirit um, and political will that really is about redistribution, sacrifice perhaps for the common good. Uh, and so in a way, it's really interesting to see how with the commission sort of introduction of, of what almost seems to become an oxymoron of compulsory but flexible solidarity, you know, it's coercing virtue. Um, we have this kind of model of solidarity that's emerging. And I also kind of in the context of thinking about this uh, in an international uh, gathering and having sat through a wonderful uh, panel this morning uh, on Africa, um, one does have to say, well, why is there this, why is Europe so important in these discussions? Uh, and I think there are a number of, uh, of reasons. And, and I think in part, it's be the nature of immigration and refugee law more generally. Uh, that if you look at the way in which particularly restrictive laws and immigration and asylum are replicated, it's almost like it has a contagion. Uh, and it's not just Europe. If you look at Latin America, there have been studies that have shown how when countries introduce certain measures, uh, they tend to be uh, repeated in other jurisdictions. So simply that kind of normative transfer is important. 
But if you confront, and I really admire Roberto's incredibly concise summary of uh, the new pact, um, because I mean, you have even there 500 pages, you've got over 40 pieces of legislation dealing with an asylum regime. So in Europe, you really have the most developed regional system that has teased out many of these concepts, which is why it provides a focal point and why its approach to solidarity uh, is so important. And I think why its emphasis in one regard on containment has really caused um, consternation. Uh, for others, it may seem that actually the approach being taken uh, by the commission uh, that offers flexibility may indeed be, as some are saying, a concession to the Vichygrad states who in the last um, uh, wave of an asylum crisis from 2015 were deeply resistant to their obligations uh, for, for relocation, that, that by adding a kind of a la carte approach to solidarity where states can select whether they're gonna relocate um, refugees, whether they're gonna provide operational support or whether they're gonna facilitate and support returns um, is in a way kind of diluting the spirit of solidarity. It's kind of a technocratic uh, solution, a realist solution. But what I really wonder is in the broader context of international law, not only in the narrower uh, domain of um, uh, refugee protection, Will this approach have a significant effect within asylum uh, and outside? Uh, so I, I think that you know what's happening in Europe um, within our now 27 states, uh, the discussions that we're having uh, mirror discussions in, in other places, but are also important. Uh, also, if you look at the the uh, focus on third countries, you know what is the impact? of this pact on countries you know, that are, were once corridors, um, referred to often as transit countries or third countries, uh, and now have the real um, danger of uh, becoming the buffer state. Uh, and if you go back, as those of you who are older in the, um, in the audience uh, will remember, during the accession process in the last big enlargement, 2004, that was a real concern of the candidate countries who were building up their capacities for refugee protection when the commission and member states were really quite clear that part of that objective was to allow for a buffer, a, a, a protection uh, from migration into the old member states. So when you're looking at the kind of approach to solidarity now, which is really based on containment uh, and continues that the, the approach, it's uh, certainly not introducing or inventing it, uh, it has really, I think, significant ramifications uh, for those countries uh, bordering uh, the EU. And what OECD data is showing is that also, while we tend to look at, and the first thing you learn when you, you are introduced to refugee law is the reality that most of the world's refugees, the overwhelming number are remain in the global South and often in countries in next door to them. But what is beginning to be evident in trends of migration is that actually migrants are settling farther away than their countries of origin that they're traveling farther. So therefore the situation of third countries and transit countries becomes more significant, um, both in terms of the concerns of, of residents within them, but also in terms of, of, of broader policy that's being put forward. And I think the last sort of issue about um, research uh, that is telling us a bit about what the future might be is recent work on what might happen with travel in the post COVID era. Uh, and all of us are envisioning a future where we'll be having these really odd virtual uh, engagements. And yet at the same time, uh, what researchers are also seeing is that there's likely once travel opens up for there to be a blip in travel, for there to be a resurgence uh, in individuals uh, migrating, et cetera. Uh, so I think you know, the, the future is really pointing to the significance of this pact and the significance of this pact uh, on uh, neighboring jurisdictions.
I want to just say, because time is very tight and we have really wonderful speakers on the panel. So um, I, I want to just say a few words uh, about the experience that's unfolding in the humanitarian disaster in, um, in the Lipa camp in Bosnia. Uh, not only because it's deeply disturbing, as all humanitarian crises are in different ways, but because I think it really epitomizes uh, the kinds of scenarios that EU migration policy um, can, if not facilitate, is unable to respond effectively to. Uh, and I, I, the one kind of um, issue that has come up in this, where you have literally hundreds of, of um, individuals who are in the winter, we're living in a camp that was designed as a response to COVID for the summer. Uh, and the camp, because the conditions were so appalling, it was set on fire in protest. And now you, you have hundreds of people um, literally living uh, outside in the snow in degrading and indeed dangerous conditions. But when you look at the kind of interaction between the regional and international actors, you're reminded of how complex the scenarios are within domestic jurisdictions. That, that while you have the LIPA camp, you have not far a facility that was built with the money, European Union money, a reception facility that local authorities are refusing to use. Uh, you have this standoff between the local authorities and the national authorities, the regional and the international. You have a complex dynamic between the, the governance within Bosnia and Herzegovina. And you have resentment and fear among local population in terms of what the ramifications are. And it really comes down to uh, the, the, when we were looking at that during the accession process, the Baltic states had this metaphor of their fear of becoming a closed sack. Uh, and while the um, European Union was really dangling the prospect of uh, membership in return for capacity building and strengthening the rule of law in the candidate countries, that kind of leverage is not really available or viable in the range of states that the European Union is interacting with. So Bosnia is a potential candidate country. It's not doing great on its scorecard because of the many obstacles domestically uh, that it's dealing with. But the idea of imposing migration management as one of these obligations may not be as enthusiastically taken up uh, as we saw uh, during the, the, the kind of major uh, enlargement uh, process that was underway in the 2000s. Uh, so I think it really raises a, a lot of concerns uh, and issues. Uh, and so what I'm going to do now is um, turn the floor over uh, to uh, Jens Veste Hansen and, and Roberto, uh, because I believe that he'll be speaking in a very similar vein on, on related issues. So thank you very much for your time. Many thanks, many thanks indeed, Rosemary, for your very rich presentations, for introducing uh, so well uh, the, the concept of, of, of solidarity, the implications of how this concept is translated into concrete policies and also uh, also, how it's, it's it's so important for understanding current developments, including this this other, if you want to call this crisis that is unfolding uh, very close to Europe uh, in in uh, in Bosnia. Uh, I think your interventions paves very well the way to for for our second presenter, uh, Professor Vested Ansen from uh, Aarhus University. And with you, Jens, we would like to delve into more details into. Uh, current policy and legal developments in Europe concerning asylum and refugee in light of the global compact. Uh, Rosemary has already introduced some aspects of the new pact. To you, I would like to ask, do you think the Commission succeeded in the stated objective of striking a balance between having fast streamlined procedures in the field of return, asylum, and the need to uphold key protection standards in the asylum process? So Jens, I give you the floor. Thanks. Thank you very much, Roberto, and thank you to uh, uh, you also, Rosemary, for your excellent introduction to this uh, discussion. Um, 
I'm, as Roberto uh, indicated, uh, I'm going to, sorry for the term here, zoom into uh, the more <clears throat> Uh, the more specific uh, details of the uh, EU Pact on Migration and Asylum. And given the particular occasion of the uh, UNHCR's uh, anniversary, my point of departure will actually be the UN Global Compact on Refugees uh, adopted in, in December 2018, which can be seen uh, as, a, as a cooperation framework that provides for a background to the examination and assessment of EU asylum policies, including the more recent uh, EU pact. Um, let me just briefly um, summarize some of the main features of the Global Compact. The guiding principles have been described uh, as humanity and international solidarity. Uh, the compact is grounded in the international refugee protection regime, meaning the 1951 uh, convention and the 1967 protocol, and also further guided by the instruments of human rights, humanitarian law, and other uh, elements of international law. This all together is meant to provide a basis for predictable and equitable burden and responsibility sharing. Uh, which certainly uh, is a relevant uh, criterion for assessing EU policies, both uh, internally uh, and in the, in the external dimension. And finally, the objectives uh, of the Global Compact uh, are described in paragraph seven as the, those, these four, easing pressures on host countries, enhancing refugee self-reliance, expanding access to third country solutions, and supporting conditions in countries of origin for the return uh, in safety and dignity. Now, I'm not going to present uh, a comprehensive uh, conclusion as to the compatibility of the EU pact uh, with these uh, objectives, uh, but I'll try to now highlight uh, some of the most important uh, features that have been uh, brought um, forward uh, by the Commission in its uh, EU pact uh, presented uh, in September last year, as well as the some of the accompanying legislative proposals. The question, of course, is do they uh, in some way, in some meaningful way, correspond to the objectives and guiding principles of the Global Compact to which the EU member states in a coordinated manner actually uh, adhered uh, back in 2018, at least most of the member states did so. Uh, I think it is fair uh, to, um, to, to condense the elements uh, of the EU pact as a policy response in these seven points. Solidarity and responsibility sharing, which is essentially to be seen in the EU pact as a quid pro quo between the solidarity measures uh, and border control and screening and containment. Uh, the frontline states wanted solidarity op for obvious reasons, as we have seen also in a recent statement by Spain, Greece, Italy, and Malta. While the other, uh, at least that's so the commission hopes, the other member states uh, will accept some elements of solidarity, as Rosemary mentioned, um, on the, being made contingent, though, on border control at the external borders, including screening and some containment measures. And this is the very delicate balance which has to be struck both in policymaking and in subsequent uh, implementation. And I'm going to highlight some risks in this uh, at, towards the end of my presentation. Uh, the second uh, element uh, in the EU pact, uh, I would say, is the prevention of secondary movements, which is closely linked to the issue of containment at external borders. Then, thirdly, securing returns, which is actually integrated also into the solidarity mechanism, because so-called return sponsorships, quite a strange phenomenon maybe, um, is actually presented in the uh, compact, sorry, in the EU pact and the uh, legislation launched as a solidarity measure. So member, st member states can show solidarity by sponsoring return efforts. Um, 
also there is going to be a, a common EU return system uh, and indeed enhanced cooperation on readmission to countries of origin and transit. The remaining elements of the EU pact, uh, I would say, uh, are uh, addressing the problem of the vanishing mutual trust within the common European asylum system. I'm coming back to this, but as you all know, uh, the mutual trust is a fundamental precondition for the common European asylum system, while at the same time mutual trust has really been vanishing. And now the Commission is suggesting that mutual trust should be uh, expanded or created, uh, secured through robust governance and implementation monitoring. The monitoring is important and we might come back to that in the discussion. Lastly, crisis preparedness uh, and crisis responses, external border management, including search and rescue mechanisms, and finally, uh, internal cooperation uh, are also put on the agenda in the EU pact. And talking about internal cooperation, uh, one one term that comes to mind here is uh, the what it, the the uh, UN compact is referring to as third country solutions. In one way, um, the EU pact is also uh, alluding to or attempting to to promote third country solutions, even though it's a kind of two way road here, as I shall illustrate in the following. If we now consider uh, the, the potential impacts uh, of the emerging policies and practices uh, under the common European asylum system, as we have seen uh, during the past decade, or even since the uh, enlargement in 2004, to which Rosemary alluded, uh, then it, it is interesting to see how as I said before, how mutual trust has been really a kind of uh, overarching uh, uh, parole or program and at the same time a vanishing reality. And what, what I consider to be a, a very serious risk inherent in the EU pact is that mutual trust internally may not be become if effectively uh, enhanced, while at the same time, the dilution of mutual trust may actually sort of become transferred to some of the some elements in the external dimension by way of the safe country uh, concept, which is really likely to become more exposed and be, to be, be, be given higher priority. The safe country notions uh, are uh, mentioned uh, uh, with quite some uh, emphasis uh, in the uh, EU pact. And as I have uh, tried to, to argue uh, in, in a blog spot uh, on the uh, Asyl Forum a couple of months ago, um, this is to be, to be operationalized in two different dimensions, so to say. There is, however, a significant risk that the safe country notions may become partly a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, and as I said, uh, there is a risk that uh, the dilution of mutual trust and other protection standards internally in the common European asylum system may impact the what you could term the external protection standards and the actual impl implementation of such standards. Let me try to explain briefly as regards safe countries of origin, uh, the um, uh, proposal for an asylum procedures regulation, including the uh, recent uh, amendment to that proposal, will provide a new ground for, uh, for, for, for um, considering a country, a safe country of origin uh, by referring to recognition rates. Uh, in itself, um, as Roberto mentioned, uh, the, the EU pact is, is based on uh, the position that we have a, an increased tendency towards mixed arrivals or mixed migration flows. And this will then play together with the idea of safe countries of origin in the sense that if a certain country of origin has a recognition rate for protection seekers uh, below 20%, that should in itself uh, provide a criterion 
for that country to be considered a safe country origin. That is a fairly sort of uh, a fairly far reaching uh, um, uh, delimitation or definition of safe countries of origin. And to, to, make, to make the risk clear here, it should be mentioned that in, 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 in crisis situations, this percentage uh, criterion will be, will be enhanced or increased up to 75%, which makes it totally absurd that, that countries from which uh, three out of four applicants are, are being recognized as in need of protection should be considered a safe country of origin. Also, the safe third country uh, notion is going to become uh, widened or expanded under the legislative proposals. We already saw how it, it has been uh, diluted or watered down uh, in the EU-Turkey uh, deal made in 2016. And I think it's safe to say that the proposals uh, are designed to legitimize what was already done in 2016. So it will be a kind of empirical matter uh, to what extent that that really lives up to uh, effective protection principles. These safe country notions will become implemented in the context of border procedures. Um, and I think uh, it will be quite crucial to the actual implementation or the actual effects of these safe country notions in which way uh, the modalities uh, of the border procedure will be, be, be working and what consequences the border procedures will have. The idea is to make uh, accelerated procedures become uh, a mandatory arrangement and some parts of the accelerated procedures will also under mand a mandatory mechanism become uh, implemented in the border procedure. That is in itself a quite risky undertaking, uh, as is well known for those who have, for instance, had a look at the uh, recent European Parliament study on border procedures. Finally, the border procedure has to be seen in connection also with the uh, arrangements for so-called pre-entry screening. There is a proposal for a separate regulation on screening at the external borders. And as far as I can see, there is a quite significant risk that the screening uh, may become conflated with the border asylum procedure, which in turn is supposed to be connected to the border return procedure. In one way, you might ask, uh, you might argue that that border screening uh, already should take place under the uh, Schengen Borders Code. So there have been proposals, suggestions that that this uh, pre-entry screening is superfluous. On the other hand, if it's going to have a separate meaning. Uh, and justify the, the significant resources that will be spent on board on this pre-entry screening. It may become a separate border control mechanism that will apparently also allow for unclear criteria for which decisions are being made, for which impact they will have on the next stages. And there is an apparent absence of procedural guarantees uh, in these uh, quasi decisions to be made in the pre entry screening. Finally, it is quite obvious that as part of the containment uh, rationale, uh, de detention uh, is going to be a, a systematic element of this uh, screening at the external borders. It has been suggested that this will provide for Moria 2 or whatever uh, name of hotspots you may want to, to illustrate, uh, to use for illustration of, of this point. So to sum up, uh, I think there is a cl quite clear risk that some of the diluting protection standards, some of those tendencies that have undermined mutual trust internally may spill over as a kind of normative transfer into the external dimension of EU asylum policies. We may come back to further aspects of this, but I would like to uh, stop by now and thank you for your attention. Many thanks, um, yes, Jens, for, uh, for your intervention and uh, for providing such a detailed comparison of the new pack in light of the global compact. You mentioned uh, really a, 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 a number of aspects that, uh, that uh, I think uh, laid the ground very well for our uh, discussion. You mentioned in particular the dilution. Uh, I quote from your, from your intervention, the dilution of protection principle and mutual trust. 
the vanishing mutual trust in, uh, with, between member states, uh, how this, uh, this trend is impacting and is going to impact on protection standards also when it comes to uh, relations with, uh, with third countries. So thanks a lot. I now immediately turn to our third speaker, Professor Audrey Macklin from Toronto University. Um, Canada is indeed often presented as a champion for the implementation of the Global Compact on Refugees, in particular when it comes to resettlement and other pathways for admission. But at the same time, Canada has also come under criticism for its uh, safe country arrangements with the EU, which allow to return asylum seekers to the US without assessing their asylum claim. So to you, Audrey, I would like to ask to draw if it's possible, uh, to ask if it is possible to, to draw a comparison between these two asylum models, Canada and the EU, what are the main difference and uh, similarities? And now the example of Canada can also ask to better understand developments in the European Union. Audrey, I, I give you the floor. Roberto, thank you very much. Um, and thank you to you, Rosemary and Jens for um, wonderful informative introductions and presentations from which I've already learned a lot. And um, really, I offer uh, Canadian examples as points of contrast and comparison here. I know there's a separate panel that is explicitly addressing the North American context. And so I'm not going to attempt to provide any kind of comprehensive review. Um, three points about Canada as distinct in its situation from EU member states. First, uh, Canada is geographically isolated from those countries that are understood to be refugee producers, so to speak, and indeed isolated from every other country except the US. And that means that virtually all refugee claimants who reach Canada do so by flying in or coming overland from the US border. And one of the results of that is that Canada, frankly, like most other uh, member sta uh, par uh, states party to the refugee convention, spent a lot of energy and resources on deflecting and preventing refugee claimants from reaching their territory. But Canada does it with great success, I must say, through remote control techniques that are less visibly violent than the ones that we see in other parts of the world. And they involve uh, pushing the border out and uh, preventing people from getting on planes uh, destined for Canada. And in the case of the Safe Third Country Agreement, which I'll discuss in a moment, preventing them from crossing the border from the United States into Canada. Another important distinction is that Canada does not have or share with other countries a regional or multilateral framework on either human rights or on asylum. So we are obviously not members of a kind of regional community like the European Union. Um, we aren't governed in common by something like the European Convention on Human Rights or indeed by the various EU um, policies, laws and practices that can then be, for example, litigated before the European Court of Justice. Our relationships on asylum and refugees to other countries is bilateral and frankly transactional. Um, and I think this reduces the scope within which to talk about solidarity. We are of course, um, active at the international level and understand, you know, Canadian foreign policy understands itself as actively engaged at that global level of solidarity. And finally, I'll just point out that Canada is what I have called uh, a normative country of immigration. Immigration is part of the national narrative. That is, immigration is necessary and vital to the social demographic economic construction of Canada in a way that is common to um, all uh, settler societies, but is uh, different from uh, so-called old world countries that understand immigration as relatively recent, uh, a supplement um, and potentially conflicting with conceptions of national identity. With that as an introduction, then let me just move to describing very briefly um, some of the policies that Canada has with respect to refugees and refugee claimants or asylum seekers that are in some sense analogous uh, or isomorphic with EU policies. Many of them were inspired by EU or European state policies, but there has been, I would say, policy transference back and forth. 
let me just start with the safe third country agreement between Canada and the United States. It looks much like the Dublin regulation, but it is bilateral. Um, it is hard to frame in the language of solidarity because the fact is that it redounds almost entirely to the benefit of Canada if you understand benefit to mean deflecting asylum seekers. Um, by this, I mean that Canada bound asylum seekers at the US border will be turned back to the United States. US bound asylum seekers at the Canadian border will be turned back to Canada. But this is hardly a, a balanced or symmetrical relationship because Canada's geographic isolation means that we receive relatively few asylum seekers who must pass through Canada to get to the United States. Whereas it is so difficult to reach Canada other than by passing through the United States or flying in that the flow is almost always kind of south to north. And so it isn't a kind of solidarity kind of relationship. Its origins lie in Canada in a sense exploiting 9-11 um, and US desires for greater control of the Canada-US border to Canada's advantage. As part of those negotiations, Canada secured this Canada-US safe third country agreement. It only applies at land borders between Canada and the United States, doesn't apply to airports, doesn't apply at marine borders. Historically, it has been challenged before Canadian courts as a violation of Canada's own Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Um, and here you see the distinction between how this agreement would be challenged in Canada versus how, for example, the Dublin regulation has been challenged, you know, starting with the uh, Greece, uh, the Belgium Greece case in 2011, right? This is all predicated on Canada's own internal uh, human rights obligations. And the way the litigation worked in its first challenge in 2007, and now again with a successful challenge in 2019, is the idea that because the United States does not honor its own international legal obligations with respect to refugees, both in the risk of refoulement, but also how it treats asylum seekers, Canada violates its domestic human rights obligations under the charter by deflecting refugee claimants into that system in the United States. Um, and so, most recently, that argument succeeded before the federal court and Canada was found to be violating the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms by deflecting refugee claimants, asylum seekers, into the US system, primarily because of US detention practices. Now, I will say that there were a wide range of violations that the Canadian litigants argued, but the court decided it on the narrowest possible grounds with respect to US practices with detention. And again, I think you can see the resonance with the ECJ, with the, sorry, uh, European court decisions regarding um, the Dublin regulation. Now, this case is on appeal to the um, Federal Court of Appeal and I, anybody's guess what will happen. But suffice to say that in the interim, Canada has adopted a new law by which Anybody who passes through one of five countries en route to Canada and makes a refugee claim in one of those five countries will have their refugee claim in Canada not refused, they won't be deflected back, but they will be shunted into an inferior process that is considered to be a fast track to no. Um, and what this demonstrates, and I'll just leave it at this, is the um, ability of the government to try to pivot to find different ways to refuse to deflect, to you know, diminish uh, refugee protection in Canada through various techniques. I can return to that if there are more questions. We had in Canada, inspired by the European Union, a safe country of origin model for several years. And indeed, when Jens was describing the ways in which under the current uh, uh, pact, uh, the EU proposes to define what is a safe country of origin, there are resonances with how the Canadian government defined a safe country as well. But this short version of how it worked really is that it took the Aznar protocol and plunked it down into Canadian law. And roughly speaking, if you were a citizen of an EU member state and a few other states, uh, then you would be shunted into um, a very inferior refugee determination process. And the idea there is that, you know, all countries in Europe are safe. And to make it even more dramatically similar to the EU, one of the arguments was that 
if you are unsafe in any particular European member state, mobility provisions under the EU, uh, under the European Union system, allow you to move to another state. So it really was uh, very much a transposition of the logic of the Aznar Protocol. It was, of course, designed really to deflect Roma asylum seekers from Hungary and other Central and Eastern European states. Lastly, I'll just say briefly uh, about um, the ways in which irregular entry has increased in Canada owing to, frankly, uh, the governance of uh, Donald Trump. And this has created various issues around defining the border, irregular entry, and much as 9-11 gave license to Canada to move forward with the Canada-US Safe Third Country Agreement, it used COVID to um, start issuing what are called direct backs and are effectively pushbacks into the United States um, from points along the Canadian US border where the Safe Third Country Agreement doesn't actually apply. Last, I want to say something about the Global Compact for Refugees and the mention of Canada uh, and its advances in resettlement. I'll just bring up two other, well, two other points. One with respect to uh, capacity building, Canada, as I understand it, is certainly funding um, some of the countries in Central America to build capacity in their refugee determination system, one presumes, to reduce the pressure on Canada with respect to um, asylum seekers from that part of the world. Uh, secondly, with respect to refugee self-reliance, there is this discussion about complementary pathways where um, refugees who might otherwise qualify as economic immigrants can be processed in that way. But last with resettlement, I'll say that Canada has earned much praise globally uh, with respect to its resettlement of refugees, and most recently and notably Syrian refugees. Um, I want to close by just injecting two cautionary notes into that celebration of Canada. I think refugee resettlement is a fine thing for sure, but first, the numbers in absolute and relative terms compared to the need are trivial. Um, secondly, to promote resettlement in countries, for example, in Europe, uh, carries some risks with it. One risk is this, if a country is, and a government and a population is adamant about reducing the um, admission of refugee claimants, asylum seekers, there is a great danger that resettlement will be presented as an alternative. Uh, that is to say, another reason to restrict and exclude asylum seekers is that we can pick and choose the truly deserving, in quotes, refugees through a resettlement process. It's important to note that resettlement, as I'm sure you're all aware, is entirely discretionary, and that siphon can be turned on or off at any time uh, by countries. Secondly, one of the dimensions of Canadian resettlement that has been uh, particularly um, uh, promoted is so-called private resettlement that allow um, private citizens to participate in the resettlement process in effect by providing financial, moral, social, um, and practical support for resettlement. It's um, a fine thing uh, as long as it is not a move to privatize resettlement. And if you have a country that doesn't have a tradition of resettlement at all, and you try to introduce private resettlement, um, first, people may resist for the very valid reason that they see this as an attempt to privatize, which should be a public responsibility. And secondly, um, you're just not gonna get any take up on it. Um, and I, I would say um, in Canada, there has always been a strong push to uh, retain the public commitment to resettlement and that's got to be vital. And last, as a measure of solidarity, uh, I would make the point that there's an interesting solidarity that can be created between private citizens and refugees, and it's worth exploring what the meaning of that solidarity is and what political valence it has. Thank you very much. Many thanks, uh, uh, Audrey, for, um, for uh, your intervention. Uh, I think uh, um, you outlined very well this, this comparison between the EU and Canada is, is, is very useful. And also some, some scholars have argued that uh, containment policies, uh, when adopting containment, containment policies, states are using creative legal thinking. And so you outlined very well how this also, they are also learning from each other when, 
while uh, while while um, introducing some 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 practices that may that may have the effect of uh, limiting uh, substantially um, international uh, protection. So. Um, Thanks a lot. I would like to thank also all the other uh, uh, speakers, three speakers, for their intervention. I would like now to turn immediately to our uh, discussant. As I mentioned, we have, we have four discussants. I would like to ask them to uh, pick up some of the issues or arguments raised by the speakers, but also feel free to add any additional aspect that uh, you may find relevant. So let's start with our first discussant. discussant. Meltem Ineli Jr. from Suleiman Demirel University. Meltem, you have worked extensively on new Turkey relations on asylum, and the new Turkey statement, the 2016 statement, has been often presented by your institution as a model to be followed when cooperating with your country. So, what I would like to ask, if you maybe can touch on your intervention about the legacy of this of this uh, statement um, on current EU reforms, and of course, of course, also what what uh, how the, the global compact what the global compact tell us about the the, the impact of this model of, of cooperation uh, melton the floor is yours thank you very much roberto and um thanks a lot for uh just invitation to act as a discussant in this really uh nice panel with such esteemed colleagues now let us start with the global compact on refugees Imagine or let's assume that we don't know anything about the GCR and we just didn't uh, listen wonderful presentations in this panel. When you Google the Global Compact of Refugees uh, on Google and you find UNHCR's website dedicated to GCR, one sentence welcomes you. The Global Compact represents the political will and ambition of the international community as a whole for strength, cooperation and solidarity with refugees in affected host countries. So when you read the sentence, you will understand that the compact is about offering better protection to refugees, giving displaced persons safe and humane ways to seek asylum and be admitted to host states. It is so the global compact is about solidarity with refugees, but also states already hosting large number of refugees, especially those in the global south. On the one hand, we have the global compact. And on the other hand, we have the new EU pact on migration and asylum, which was just uh, presented a few months back. And when you read the press release presenting the new Migration Act, you see that um, fair sharing of responsibility and solidarity is also one of the pillars of the new EU Pact on Migration and Asylum. However, when you read the proposals and policy documents, which is, as, as Rosemary mentioned, pages and pages, you realize that the pact actually places too much emphasis on return and readmission and efficient and faster asylum and return procedures, as Jens just perfectly described. The pact even proposes, in my understanding, to redefine solidarity as to include return sponsorships, which is basically if a member state cannot effectively return a third country national or a stateless person, it asks another member state for help. And if another member state does this, to return a third country national or a stateless person. This is understood as a means of solidarity in the pact, which I find it quite problematic because it erodes the meaning of solidarity and cooperation, which is a central theme of the Global Compact on Refugees. Solidarity should be about protecting refugees and protecting displaced persons and not returning them. The problematic approach to intra-EU solidarity in the newly presented Pact on Migration and Asylum sadly is also reflected in solidarity with third countries. As you mentioned, uh, the new pact does little to change uh, EU's approach to EU third country uh, cooperation arrangements and deals with third countries. Although the pact is presented as a new beginning, it does not promise to change the utilitarian and pragmatic nature of EU third country cooperation agreements and deals in the field of migration. I'm sure everyone in this virtual room are aware of legal problems relating to the EU Turkey statement of March 2016. A lot of authors have 
in that lay uh, examined the legal problems and the humanitarian problems related to this deal. And we have just wrote about it with Orchard Nolosoy in the set um, in the Azil blog. But I'm sure you already know that how the EU did it, did not own up to the EU Turkey statement and the statement is accepted as a soft law instrument concluded between member states and Turkey individually which as a consequence is the, uh, the EU in a sense escaped legal responsibility arising from the arrangements uh, of the EU Turkey statement. How the camps like Moria ended up being built to detain hundreds of asylum seekers and migrants on the Greek islands as a consequence of this deal. More importantly, how the statement, which was agreed as a temporary measure to deal with a so-called migration crisis in 2015, is in, is in actually its fifth year now, and readmission of migrants and rejected asylum seekers to third countries became a central team in European migration policies to manage asylum and migration. So finally, what is quite problematic about the EU Turkey statement is also how the statement managed to turn resettlement, which is conventionally a purely humanitarian act and tool of responsibility sharing into a, a mi migration management tool. As you know, resettlement from Turkey, uh, from Turkey to EU under the statement is conditioned upon a person to be readmitted by Turkey, which already hosts the largest number of refugees in the world with more than 4 million forcibly displaced persons. So when you compare the GCR and the, uh, the new pact on migration and asylum, you see stark differences and you see stark differences in defining solidarity. Uh, in my understanding, if the EU really wants to align its asylum law and policies to that of the, the GCR, it needs to rethink its understanding of solidarity, its cooperation with third countries, and focus on protecting people, not returning them. And this is my take on a comparison between the GCR and the EU third uh, country deals and the new pact on migration and asylum. Thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot indeed, Melton, for uh, outlining uh, some of the key challenges raised by the current EU approach and also for the outlining the need for a kind of um, uh, reshaping EU policies or, or a change in approach uh, in EU policies if we want to address these uh, uh, key challenges. I would like now to address, to turn to our second uh, uh, discussant, Mohamed Badran, founder and director of the Association Syrian volunteers in the Netherlands. Uh, Mohammed, the global compact includes positive language on refugee participation in the process of uh, policy design and refugee led organizations are expected indeed to play a key role in this regard. So we are very eager to, hear, to have your take on this based on your experience in advocating in the international uh, in the, and also national venues to promote the inclusion on refugee voices and experiences in decision making what's what is missing in current EU policies and how could the, the current situation be improved thank you robert uh, roberto and uh, hi everyone thank you also for inviting me to be uh, a discussant uh, in this great uh, topic and uh, panel um, um i think i will start um with uh, i mean trying to see how you know, um, when 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 the when the start of the so-called uh, refugee or migration crisis in Europe in 2015, um, and how when we uh, look at uh, solidarity and um, at that time, um, and then we see uh, and then compare it to now, um, we see that um, at that time, especially I mean everyone remembers the the picture of the of the child Alan. Uh, when, when he found at the sea how, how all um, most of the EU countries that took the action immediately in opening the borders and accepting refugees and welcoming refugees, also from, from, from the civil society. Um, however, I mean, in these five years, uh, we haven't seen um, any changes or improvements in the lives of refugees and migrants. Um, even worse, actually, um, the opposite happening. I mean, uh, the example of the, of the Camp Moria and, and the, the situation that, that we arrived, but even um, how solidarity changed from 
um, from from 2015 to uh, to, to to when the, the the situation of of Moria happened. Neither of the like most of the EU countries they they tried to blind their eyes about about the situation and they didn't want to even accept it was it was very hard even to um, to accept an um, any any kind of refugees or holding or, or helping these refugees even though that uh, when we talk about sharing responsibility that that should be um, the main thing uh, uh, whether you know this new pack uh, um, on migration or the global compact when when we talked about it. Um, uh, you, you mentioned about, um, I mean, uh, the work that refugee, um, about, about refugee-led uh, organizations and the work that they have been doing in the last few years. I think that they have done a tremendous job in advocating for, for a meaningful um, participation of refugees in all of the policy making processes and, and development. And that is essential. I mean, participation, meaningful participation is essential. I mean, how can we make sure that any deal uh, or any uh, policy that it's directed to um, to help refugees, as as we intended to um, to to see these policies, is is uh, being developed without the perspective of the refugees and the, of the most affected ones. If we look um, um, at at the new pact deal, we see that um, there the, there are some language has been reflected. I mean, in the GCR, um, there are some more than more than four paragraphs mentioning the meaningful refugee participation. Of refugee-led organizations, how important in that is, is that, and that is the result of the of the work um, uh, my colleagues that we have done in the in the last few years. Um, but also, um, uh, if we see in the new pack, uh, we see that some some of these languages are being reflected. For example, the expert group that they that they have um, they have put into into action. That's something great. But but I mean to move uh, to even further. I mean, how can we even in the in the third country, if we are going to make a deal with a with Turkey or, or another country? How are we going to make sure that the refugees who are we making the deal for them are, are being represented and their interests are being protected rather than just, you know, being the political interest of, of any countries, you know, just reserved. But how can we make sure that the refugees who are the most affected Yes, um, I think who we are, are a problem. Who, who needs to be uh, centered at, at the middle. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, now yes, now yes. Uh, please continue. We lost Sorry. you for a... Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, to end with my um, uh, my take on, I think um, meaningful uh, meaning, meaningful refugee participation is essential, and it should be at um, at any pack or any new uh, policy um, that we are going to to achieve that um, you know the improvement of the lives of refugees on the ground, um, and it's 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 the first step uh, that's actually needed to to achieve the self reliance. Of, of these refugees, um, as well as um, you know, um, a, a better cooperation between 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 the different stakeholders. Um, if we don't take that seriously, if we don't take um, refugee voices, if we don't see them as as an active agents, then we cannot um, uh, have any. Um, we're gonna just uh, have like the vicious cycle of these policies that just keep repeating itself um, and without any improvements. And we are just gonna uh, have to face the worst, um, uh, even even worse than than what happened with the camp of Moria. Um, and that's what I'm what I'm afraid of. Um, yeah, I will uh, uh, stop here. Thank you. Thanks, Mohamed, for your, uh, for your very uh, interesting uh, presentation and also for really outlining the, the, the key, the, the crucial importance of, of, of uh, um, including uh, refugee experiences and voices on new policies and how this is indeed crucial for improving, improving uh, on the ground these policies and avoiding some of the, the, the negative consequences that uh, we have seen in uh, in uh, in uh, in the previous years, uh, and uh, also remembering how the the, the global compact of refugees indeed set the ground for 
for this uh, for this additional um, effort. I would like to turn now immediately to um, to our uh, third um, discussant, Anila uh, Anila Noor. Um, you have a long-standing experience, Anila, too, in the field of advocacy and developing initiative in support of refugee women. But you are also a member of the European Commission expert group on the views of migrants in the field of asylum, migration, and integration. So I would like to ask you to give your, uh, your um, assessment of the current challenges in Europe based on uh, our discussion so far. Anila, I give you the floor. Yeah, thank you, Robert, and thank you, everyone, for having me here. It's a really privileged to be part of this discussion, but as a refugee myself, it should be our right to be part of this, this discussion and to be on the table of discussion, which is becoming more complicated. Uh, so our speakers in this uh, uh, session and our panelists, they already talking about the new pact of migration asylum, uh, which is proposing fair share responsibility and solidarity between member states. And if we see uh, the new pact, they are really uh, trying to uh, propose uh, new entry points, uh, which uh, including screening involving health identity and security checks. And they also trying to make a uh, new arrangement of faster asylum border process involving decision within 12 weeks and such as faster returns of denied application. Um, but I really want to highlight the compact uh, which is objective number four or uh, sport condition in countries of a region for returns in safety and dignity, which is taking as a um, uh, element in the new pact about promoting voluntary return is a key uh, suggest, uh, strategy objective of the EU migration policy in the new pact. Because why I'm trying to take this uh, specifically element from the EU pact because as a representative of uh, refugee and migrants, we believe every policy, they are just taking their own understanding how they need to need, uh, deal with these uh, communities. But we as a refugee, we think they are way behind understanding uh, our needs and how uh, they are presenting us. Though this new strategy, which they are taking uh, as a voluntary returns to make us safe returns for the people who really want to go back. but we as a refugees representative, we think this is a weaponizing. They are making a tool, you know, making us a uh, lame excuse to force uh, communities to return back uh, to their countries. Like if in case of uh, Afghanistan, in so many countries, they're taking as a safe country to return, but actually it's not true. How they're presenting uh, Afghanistan is safe. It's a, it's, it's a big, uh, you know, laws for if we are uh, sending banned people uh, to Afghanistan from different European countries. And on, on the other side, we also uh, thinking about voluntarily how they are making this assessment, how you can make sure what is voluntarily, because the system is not recognizing the need of uh, refugees, asylum seeker, and they said, okay, they are coming uh, by illegal pathways and they are entering uh, Europe illegally. So instead of giving them safety, instead of giving the right to asylum, instead of giving them to stay safe, they are forcing them to go return back. So we are in conversation and we are trying to be a part of uh, EU uh, um, uh, advisory board and uh, part of expert group, we are trying to actually negotiate and give them the understanding. Direct what we are consulting from our communities and give them more understanding that this is a long way. Still, this new pact is becoming like a quite ambitious, but so much is a vague, it's like so, so many gray areas, and we are trying to negotiate how we give them understanding about what refugees need and what need to be changed. And this is a no, uh, a no way to send them back to their countries until they are giving a pr uh, proper trainings, proper channels, either it's so social, psychological, and even the data, the data, how their interpretation of safety is really needed, is, is interpretation of voluntarily needed. And we are trying to give them the tools and the understanding. And about the uh, mention about human element is being missing. And we really need to put who these refugees are we talking about? They're women, they're uncompleted minors, they are undocumented uh, people, they are stateless persons. We really need to unpack these old elements 
if we are talking about in the policy, these policy languages are getting more and more complex and complex, and we really need to change it. And we really need to the change the narratives, how they are putting again, like if they are talking about solidarity, but still, in, if you go in deep in the uh, policy, they are really taking it as a burden. They are not sharing uh, their share, but they are thinking migrants, refugees who are coming into the Europe, they are burdened and we need to share this burden. So this is my intake and I'm here um, uh, really uh, to see how we can put this, unpack this meaningful way uh, to complement this policy when it comes to implementation. Thank you. Many thanks, many thanks indeed, uh, Anila, also for for focusing for the for focusing your intervention on uh, on the objective of ensuring returning safety and dignity. And uh, we know that uh, uh, some, some speak, previous speakers have already mentioned the pact put a strong emphasis on return. But how what are the conditions for ensuring sustainability uh, of return uh, of, of of people uh, from from Europe? Um, so it's now time for our last uh, uh, discussant, Nicolas Feitan from the Danish Institute of Human Rights. Uh, so Nicolas, you are the last discussant. You also have the privilege in a way to wrap up our discussion. Uh, you worked recently on a comprehensive study with Professor Vestel Hansen on EU arrangements with third countries uh, in the area of asylum in the context of the ASIL project. One of the key issues you have looked at is the interplay in this arrangement between containment and mobility approaches, one of the issues that has been touched by also by previous speakers. So based on that study, what are the main features of uh, these arrangements and what are the, the, the key issues that they raise? Thanks so much, Roberto. It's lovely to be with you. And as you mentioned, my brief today is to briefly give you a sort of readout of this forthcoming publication. Um, which examines um, EU arrangements with third countries, primarily of transit, that would be Turkey, Turkey, Serbia, Niger, and Tunisia in the field of asylum governance. So in my five minutes, I'm gonna to touch on um, three sort of key takeaways or headlines and then, and then point to some further research needs in this area. The first is I would like to discuss very briefly the role of the Global Compact on Refugees in these third country arrangements undertaken by the EU. And the, the takeaway here essentially is that EU arrangements do not reflect a significant engagement with the GCR itself at this point. Now, of course, it's important to bear in mind that the GCR is a relatively new instrument. And of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has certainly disrupted the rollout and implementation of the compact. That said, when we look at um, EU publications in this area, when we look at primary EU instruments like the uh, EU Trust Fund for Africa or the Madad Fund, we don't see uh, strong references to the GCR. And perhaps most tellingly in the EU pact itself, the GCR is only mentioned with respect to third country solutions to admission in the EU. And most notably, of course, the policy transfer, as Audrey mentioned, of uh, ca Canada's private sponsorship of refugees model. So in sum, while current EU arrangements with third countries clearly do overlap with GCR objectives, more substantial alignment with the compact from the EU side remains to be seen. Secondly, if we could characterize some of these um, third country arrangements undertaken by the EU since 2015, there are two sort of standout uh, characterizations to be made. The first is that rather than conducting legal agreements in this area of asylum governments, the EU has focused on a clear informalization trend, um, taking arrangements beyond the limits of EU law into the policy or informal realm. And this, of course, raises, raises questions, as Milton has mentioned, with respect to the EU-Turkey statement and questions of transparency and accountability within the EU legal order. Simultaneously, while these EU instruments are generally informal in nature, the actors that implement them are increasingly varied. So while EU agencies such as EASO and Frontex 
are physically present in a number of these third country arrangements, notably in Serbia. The EU financial instruments I mentioned earlier uh, include a very broad range of both international organizations such as IOM and UNHCR, as well as international and national NGOs as implementing partners. So um, what then can be said about the, the nature of these um, EU arrangements with these four predominantly transit countries I've mentioned? As Roberto mentioned, there is a very strong focus on containment in EU policy making in this area. And while mobility, that is third country solutions via resettlement and complementary pathways are present in some EU arrangements, they remain relatively small in scale and often ad hoc in nature. And moreover, we see this quite interesting dynamic emerging whereby these mobility structures are embedded in broader containment approaches. So Melton's referred to the use of uh, resettlement as a migration management technique in the context of the EU, EU Turkey statement. And also if we look at the emergency transit mechanism being operated out of Niger as a corollary to EU policy in Libya. So as a result, while containment remains the dominant paradigm in EU arrangements, we can see the emergence of this contained mobility dynamic in current instruments. And of course, this rather containment heavy nature of current EU arrangements makes access to international protection in these third states particularly crucial with onward mobility options often extremely rare. And there are real questions as to whether current EU arrangements do allow access to international protection in these third states. If we think about Turkey and Serbia, for example, there are real questions as Jens has raised about the notion of safety uh, uh, under the safe third country notions. Uh, in Niger, there's questions about uptake and quality of a national protection system. And in Tunisia, there is the complete lack of a national asylum system. So finally, I'd like to um, raise a further area for um, legal research in, in EU asylum governance policy making. And that is of course, well, what are the legal limits of these containment arrangements? And it's worth recalling here that while the GCR is a non-binding instrument, it's explicitly grounded in hard international law, in particular, the 1951 convention and its 1967 protocol. In turn, then, these international instruments are, of course, anchored in the various EU treaties, the TFEU, for example, and of course, the EU Charter. So there's further work to be done to unpack the applicability of international refugee law, human rights law, and EU law standards in the external dimension of EU arrangements. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to Nicholas for, uh, for your intervention and for really outlining a number of uh, issues of research that uh, uh, of this field of uh, arrangements with third countries, race, legal issues, and the impact on, on third countries. Um, we, are, we are having some, some issues with, uh, with uh, time, time constraints, and uh, this implies that we have only a few minutes left. So, um, I, we will need to revise a bit our schedule, and I would like to to address immediately some uh, some of the question of uh, from, from from the audience. And there is in particular one question that I think it's uh, it's particularly uh, relevant from Resha Yalali from Ekran. I think it's also uh, relevant for many of the discussions because uh, many of the discussions that I've, I've outlined the the futures of this containment uh, uh, approach in light of the global compact of refugees, this has emerged very well in our discussion, but the question is how this uh, path dependent, so let's say, approach towards containment can be, um, can be broken. Uh, the question specifically is, uh, how, my question is how we as civil society organization, uh, we can push the UN member state to respect and stick to the global compact on refugee objective and how can, can it be litigated given the non-legally binding nature of the global compact on refugees? So uh, litigation, uh, legal litigation has been mentioned. Uh, I would like to, address, to ask our speaker if they think this could be a way to, 
to change, to produce change in new policies or what are the, the, any, the, the other tools, means available to, to, to address some of the most uh, uh, negative uh, aspects of, uh, of the current uh, trends towards containment. I would maybe like to give the floor to our uh, uh, three speakers, uh, Rosemary, uh, Jens and Audrey. I would like really uh, to ask you to be brief because we have only a few minutes left. I give the floor to, to, to Rosemary if, he wants to, if she wants to, to comment on this. Very briefly, I'll defer to Jens as the, as the EU lawyer, but I think a lot of what is coming across in the presentations is that actually the direct and indirect effect of containment policies result in human rights violations. So that while one can't litigate the global compact, one can certainly litigate policies that run counter to it that give rise to human rights violations that are protected under international instruments. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Rosemary, for this uh, uh, comment. Uh, Jens, would you like to comment uh, uh, briefly on this, how we can start addressing this uh, uh, containment? And as we see, containment is often related to crisis, uh, and or how, at least how a crisis is framed in the EU. Thank you, Roberto, Roberto, and uh, thank you to the uh, ECRI representative for, for, for this very pertinent question. As I just tried to, to, to write in, in, a, in, in a written answer, um, it is true uh, that there is really a, a change for, for civil society policymakers to try to Im influence the, the, the EU pact discussions and legislative procedures in order to, to enhance compatibility with the global compact. As Nick uh, uh, already mentioned, uh, there is uh, little uh, reference to the uh, Global Compact. Uh, and uh, the reference which is there uh, is about um, the, the uh, complementary pathways. Um, I was insufficient in, in pointing to, to these, uh, uh, what I termed as, as third, co third country solutions. But it's clear that, that where the EU uh, is where the EU is trying to uh, to to uh, emphasize, or the, where the Commission is trying to emphasize co cooperation with with uh, non-EU states, uh, that is where I think uh, there, there would be possibilities for for civil society to to to, emph to to push towards better compliance with the Global Compact. When it comes to the the internal dimensions, the uh, amendments of the Common European Asylum System, I would say that the arguments or the uh, advocacy should rather be based on the fundamental rights uh, principles which are common to both the global compact and eu law uh, already thank you thanks a lot jens for this additional comment uh, i would like to ask uh, audrey if uh, she has any additional uh, comment on this uh, on this uh, on same issue Thank you. I think it would be presumptuous of me to speak about how um, activists in the European Union um, should be addressing this. I am sure that you deal with, as do uh, civil society organizations in Canada, the real danger of co-optation when you are called upon or you are, in quotes, consulted on matters that have already been decided and where the terrain of discourse is predetermined and the risk that that poses of then being um, described as having been consulted and having participated meaningfully when that isn't really the case. And, and I think that's often why litigation becomes the only pathway. It, it should always be a last resort, not a first resort. And I'm sure everybody uh, knows that, but I, I'm distressed by the, you know, by the very small space within which meaningful consultation um, with uh, refugees and, and um, advocacy groups can can happen, but that that's true of Canada, and then it's my perception that's part of the problem in the EU. But I don't want to be too presumptuous. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Audrey, for this uh, uh, um, further uh, comment. I think um, for, uh, uh, we are sorry that we are running, uh, our time is about uh, to expire. We have only a few minutes left. 
So I'm really sorry that we cannot address in further details uh, other uh, questions that are uh, coming in, but we are, of course, always uh, and, uh, and willing um, and happy to follow up this uh, in the context, uh, in the follow up of this, uh, of this session um, for many other questions you may have. Uh, there are only two minutes uh, left, so I would like to close by uh, thanking all the panelists for their valuable contribution. I would like to thank also all the participants for being with us and for actively contributing to, uh, to the discussion uh, with their question. A final thank also to the University of Essex for their, for the team in uh, Texas for their work in organizing this session. And also to my uh, colleagues at SEPS, Miriam, uh, Miriam and Chun, for their uh, support. Uh, I would like to wish you a good continuation of the day. I uh, remind you that there are still other uh, regional sessions uh, today um, on Latin America. And also, uh, I would like to invite you to check the program uh, on the website. So thanks again and uh, uh, all the best. <laughs>